Back in April of 2014, Lucasfilm announced that they were closing the book on the existing Star Wars Expanded Universe, which had existed for decades. Due to their plans to tell new stories in the Star Wars universe through their new comic book line through Marvel, as well as a new television series and book series, and as well as side story films like Rogue One, the old Extended Universe had frankly become a millstone around their neck. On the one hand, as a fan of the old Expanded Universe, it felt like Disney was leaving some great elements of their lore behind Star Wars behind. On the other hand, it meant that the old Expanded Universe, which would now be called the Legends continuity, had become complete. The books closed. No new pages would be written in it. Which means that now is a great time to examine the Expanded Universe chronologically. Not in terms of how events played out in the timeline from the days of the Old Republic to the birth of the New, but in terms of how the universe is built, where the cornerstones and building blocks were laid, and what became of the structure that resulted. Or perhaps as a better example, what from the initial seeds that grew a larger trunk, what branches led to nothing, and what bore great fruit. This is perhaps even more topical, as the current season of Star Wars Rebels, as of this recording, is introducing one of the ex one of the Legends continuity, the old extended Man Universe's most popular antagonists, Grand Admiral Thrawn, into the setting. So, in this series, Legends of the Force, I will be discussing the Star Wars Legends continuity from its beginning to its end. I'll be discussing some of the background of how these works came to be, when there's something to talk about. And I'll be, from there, discussing the work's plot, character development for any recurring characters who appear on the work. And by recurring characters, I mean Luke, Han, Leia, the classic film protagonists, as well as ones who will play out into works created by other authors and other mediums. So, as far as the scope of this series goes, oh, before I forget, also, of course, we need to discuss world building, duh. The world building of the universe itself, worlds that are developed, concepts that are introduced that will also play out in other works, such as the Mandalorians, some other notes and stuff that's worth mentioning there, and my thoughts on the work itself, naturally. So, scope. As far as it goes, I'm focusing on print media, books and comics. Films such as the Ewoks direct-to-video films are going to be skipped, as are animated series like the Droids and Ewoks cartoon series and the Boba Fett animated sequence from the Star Wars Holiday Special. Additionally, I'm skipping direct adaptations of the films, whether in prose or graphic novel forms. If something that was revealed in novelizations, such as a deleted scene bringing up something that's important, and that becomes relevant in later works, I'll bring it up at that time. Now, the Expanded Universe as we know it began with the introduction of Thrawn and with Timothy Zahn's original trilogy of Heir to the Empire, Dark Force Rising, and The Last Command. But the Expanded Universe started far before then. It started as the films were coming out, contemporary, contemporaneously with the original trilogy. And so before we get to the stuff that I grew up on, and that you perhaps grew up on, Zahn, the Dark Horse Star Wars comics... 
all the way through, you know, well, the New Jedi Order and beyond, we must begin at the beginning with Splinter of the Mind's Eye by Alan Dean Foster. It cannot be stressed enough that Star Wars had no guarantee of success. This is a big-budget science fiction film made at a time when most science fiction films were relatively low-budget, and any higher-budget affairs were coming from tried-and-true directors with more cerebral plots, like Kubrick's 2001 A Space Odyssey. Further, while the other hallmark at the time of successful science fiction cinema, Planet of the Apes, had gotten not only a sequel, but sequels, they were generally sequels that were effectively lower budget than the original film. So, while George Lucas had a multi-film story in mind when he created the first Star Wars movie, there was a distinct risk that for a second installment he would have to moderate his expectations for the next film. Fortunately, Star Wars was a massive smash hit, and Lucas was able to get a much larger budget in turn allowing for a, most, a more ambitious film for a second installment in the series, which became Empire Strikes Back. So, once he had a larger budget with a bigger canvas available to him, Lucas began working on the new larger story for that film, with Lucas writing the story structure, while the script would be written initially by Leah Brackett. Brackett had written several major screenplays of films that are legendary, films like The Big Sleep, Rio Bravo, and The Long Goodbye, in addition to having written numerous science fiction novels and short stories, during the golden age of pulp SF. Sadly, Brackett was not able to complete her portion of the screenplay, and other writers had to take over after her due to her untimely death. However, Lucas has also still had his existing, less ambitious story that he worked on, and he'd had locked up a lot of the right licensing rights to Star Wars for himself as part of his deal with 20th Century Fox. He took those rights and licensed the comic rights to Marvel, who at that time was already branching out into mobile licensed comics. For the book rights, they went to Del Rey, a dedicated science fiction imprint of Ballantine Books, edited by science fiction author, author and editor Lester Del Rey, from whence the imprint took its name. To his adapt his story into prose fiction, Lucas worked with Alan Dean Foster, who had ghostwritten the novelization of the original Star Wars film. The writing price of the novel actually started before the figures were in for Star Wars, so at the time, the plan was for Lucas and Foster to proceed forward with this story for the second film, with Foster doing once again doing the novelization and Lucas doing the screenplay. But once Lucas and Fox realized what they had, Lucas decided to move forward with Empire, also in the process of moving the screenwriting duties up to a more established legend in the form of Leah Brackett, while letting Foster, who certainly was had plenty of reputation in his own right, proceeding with Splinter. This is shown in the final work by some bits in the broad strokes, being clearly marked by the original story structure as a film, and the limitations thereof for the budgetary concerns. While some of the nitty-gritty details are also clearly marked by Lucas's reduced involvement, and thus less reduced feedback in terms of specific details that play out in the book itself. In case of the former, Han Solo does not appear in the story due to concerns that when, when the original story and the novel were being written, whether they could afford Harrison Ford, who had already started to build up a significant reputation and was building in popularity from his performance as Han Solo. A dogfight, additionally, was also cut from the story due to budgetary limitations of whether they could afford the motion control camera work to do a fighter dogfight in this film. On the other side of things, the lighter side, as written in the story, Vader has the same colored lightsaber blade as Luke, as opposed to Vader having a red blade and Luke having a blue blade. And R2-D2 is referred to as a D2 unit, as opposed to a R2 unit, or just as R2. Luke, Leia, C-3PO, and R2-D2 are en route to meet up with a conclave of resistance movements in order to try and get them to join the Rebel Alliance. En route, Leia's ex uh, Y-Wing runs into mechanical problems and is forced to sit down on a presumed-to-be-uninhabited planet, Mimban, that turns out to be a covert mining colony run by the Empire. I'm not exactly sure why the Empire would need to run a mining colony covertly. 
In the course of trying to find parts or transport, Leia and Luke discover a strange old woman named Hetty, who has a shard of a crystal called the Kyber Crystal, which has the ability to focus the perception of the Force in those who can perceive it. Luke touches this shard, and his Force perception is greatly heightened, while Leia senses nothing. Luke suspects that this spice spike in his awareness of the Force can be perceived by other Force-sensitive people at some distance, possibly even by the Emperor. Luke and Leia, when roughhousing playfully after this point as part of their awkward romantic tension, end up getting the attention of the local garrison and are arrested. Leia has her post-traumatic stress disorder, caused by her torture on the Death Star, triggered at the mention of the Imperial Governor, and then they are thrown in a cell with two large furry creatures called Yuzum, which are basically Wookiees who are currently nursing really terrible hangovers. Hetty helps break out Luke and Leia, with Luke and Hetty pooling their Force abilities to levitate a food tray to trigger the motion sensors for the door, which is not very secure, before they escape. On the way out, the Yuzum kill some cruisers and ver stormtroopers in very gruesome fashions, up to and including beating troopers to death with their own limbs and the limbs of their comrades. After escaping and traveling cross country, they end up encountering some local wildlife and end up with some natives who haven't gotten hooked on booze and drugs by the Empire in the Empire's attempt to keep them docile. Luke ends up succeeding in a trial by combat against the strongest warrior of the natives, just in time for some stormtroopers and Darth Vader, who also, more justifiably, triggers Luke's P Le Leia's PTSD to show up and attack. Vader and the troopers are pushed back, and our heroes commandeer a Imperial transport to reach the temple where the crystal is, with the Yuzum once again literally ripping troopers to shreds. Luke and Leia arrive, but as they're investigating the temple, Vader shows up at the transport and kills the Yuzum, and arrives in the chamber with the crystal right after Luke's party does. Leia ends up in a lightsaber duel with Vader, which he loses at, but is not killed because Vader, like a cat, wants to play with his prey before killing it. Killing. Luke force pulls his lightsaber to him and manages, with some force assistance from Obi-Wan, to knock Vader into a pit. This does not kill Vader, but he won't be getting out for quite some time. Enough time for Leia and Hetty to grab the Kyber crystal and our heroes to escape. Luke is Force-sensitive and has learned a new ability, Force Pull. He's also romantically interested in Princess Leia, who at this time is not known to be his sister. Leia, on the other hand, at least in, according to this story, is not Force-sensitive. She has developed very bad PTSD from her time on the Death Star caused by her torture, but oddly, not by seeing her homeworld and everyone she's ever known and loved growing up as a child destroyed and is triggered at the mention of Imperial Governors and by Darth Vader himself. The latter makes complete sense, as he was present for the torture, and is, frankly, the nightmare fuel for numerous children throughout the 1970s and 80s. Imperial Governors, less so. Tarkin himself, sure, but Governors as a group, not so much. For the droids R2-D2 and C-3PO, Vader knows the authentication codes to shut them down automatically. We learn that the Emperor, whose last name we don't know yet, is Force-sensitive. And as for Vader himself, we learn that Vader likes to play with his opponents before killing them. This, in turn, is the fatal flaw that allows him to be defeated by Luke. He is actively sadistic, gloating about spending a longer time torturing Leia this time than he did on the Death Star. This is also the first time we see him actually kill a subordinate who failed them, failed him, as he was stopped in A New Hope. We learned the following in this book. The Empire has rules regarding the treatment of indigenous populations, rules that are ignored in the place of Minban, the planet in this book. The Rebel Alliance is recruiting other resistance groups, particularly following their loss of manpower in the wake of the destruction of the, of the Death Star, which also means there are other resistance groups that are unaffiliated with the Rebel Alliance. Governors are not just responsible for planets, they're responsible for whole systems. And tied into this, the, the dissolution of the Senate in The New Hope, in A New Hope, has upped the bureaucratic headache of running the system, 
and the planets they're in, which is actually something that is brought up in the script for A New Hope and in the dialogue. Presumably the Death Star would not have included the ability to cut through red tape, so this still would have been a problem. Tarkin's idea of fear reigning in potentially si systems that were going to uprise would not have necessarily made governor's jobs easier. The book has a foreword by George Lucas saying that he is, at the time of the publication, writing the story for the second film, which will become Empire Strikes Back, and he's planned to do nine films total in the series, which explains where the whole nine film rumor came from, from Lucas himself. As stilted as the dialogue is in A New Hope, Splinter of the Mind's eye is so much worse. Several of the characters have straight up Silver Age comics levels of continuity. We're talking like 1960s Stan Lee, 1960s Batman and Superman comics, just tons of dialogue providing exposition. This isn't helped by the fact that this is basically the second Star Wars work at this time of publication, including the original film and the novelization thereof, with the, perhaps the exception of the Star Wars comics, which were occurring somewhat contemporaneously. So no one has anyone else's voice figured out yet. That said, Vader in particular feels just jarringly out of character. Yes, he has a flair for the dramatic. He's a guy in a big suit with a deep, raspy voice and a cape. And he's certainly evil. There's no doubt of that. But here his cruelty is so much more vicious. You know those characters in anime and manga who demonstrate how cruel and sadistic and vicious they are by licking the blood from the knife, uh, from the blade of their sword or knife? Vader in his book would be that if he, you know, didn't need his helmet and you could lick a lightsaber safely. It also bears mentioning that this book is considerably more graphically violent than the films with actual gore. Dismemberments abound, not just like the one-off we get in the Moss Eisley Cantina, with more than a few people being beaten into unrecognizability as humanoids by the Yuzum, like mop the gore out of the vehicle level of, of unrecognizability. While Dark Horse never really bothered with the Comics Code Authority, this probably still would not have flown in much of their books, even like their adaptations of R-rated works like Robocop or Starship Troopers. We'll see how this plays out when we get to the comic adaptation of Splinter of the Mind's Eye later. In the next installment of Legend of the Force, we will get into the first chunk of the Marvel Comics initial Star Wars series, going between A New Hope and Empire Strikes Back. Once again, thank you very much for watching. If you enjoyed the show, please like and subscribe to this channel. Subscribing gets you notified when future episodes come out. And liking lets me know that you enjoyed the episode. The video on the right will be of the previous episode of Nintendo Power Retrospectives, if you want to go see what I reviewed previously that on that show. And the video on the left will take you to the previous episode of Breaking It All Down, while well, you'll get to see what I covered there. And below that will be a link to my Patreon page if you wish to back the show. Backing the show can get you a mention in the credits, and also, depending on your level of support, you can determine what I do future Let's Plays of on Breaking It All Down and what else I review on that show as well. So go ahead and click on that and back the show. Also, backing the show helps me get the show out more often and improve the production quality of the show, which is good for everybody. Once again, thank you very much for watching and see you next time.